This episode is sponsored by Kaplan Medical. If you head over to captest.com and use the offer code ITB15, you can get 15% off any Kaplan Medical product. And importantly, for AMA members, you can combine this discount with your AMA membership for a total of 40% off. I want to live outside, live outside of all of this. Welcome to the Inside the Boards podcast, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn to think like a question writer so you can study smarter, not harder, and succeed in medical school. You're listening to an archived episode of our 2017 Study Smarter series for the USMLE Step 1 and Comlex Level 1. Today's guest is Doc Osare. That is, I'll let you say your full name. Mohammed Hajigasami Osara. <laughs> That's why I was going to let name, you do it. I just go by Doc Osara. Yep. Um, and I could see why. I could see why. Like, uh, you, you know, uh, your huge YouTube channel, forward slash Mohammed, um, yeah. and the rest of your names, uh, might, be, it might be a little hard for search engine optimization. But people and for can. Patience. And for patients, too. But you can find his great study advice, tons of videos, hundreds of thousands, probably millions at this point of views at youtube.com slash Doc Osare. So that's O-S-S-A-R-E-H, correct? That's right. And Rachi, I think we just hit 5 million views. 5 <laughs> million? Right. Oh, man, we've got some catching up to do on the audio side of things. <laughs> um, <laughs> We're welcoming him today on the podcast because he is, like us, committed to free open access medical, I guess, advice slash education and is a neurology resident. So he's going to provide some expertise and um, learning related to some neuroscience questions for step one level stuff. But before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about the growth of your, your channel. What inspired you to... And he's being paged. <laughs> That's the hospital. <laughs> Real life medicine right there. Yep. Answering pages, even at home. <laughs> <laughs> I bet uh, all the students listening, they're like, oh my gosh, I cannot wait to be a real doctor. And you know, when I is... <laughs> was a third year med student, having a pager to me was like the coolest thing ever. I felt like I had a Lamborghini and yeah. I would sit there eagerly as I walked the wards hoping to get a page. Yeah. You never do. Now, gosh, when you're doing the night flow and it's 3 a.m. and you get another page, I don't know what I was thinking as a third year student. <laughs> yeah, I know. Because I also thought I was cool, like, as an intern, uh, maybe for, like, a week, maybe two weeks, maybe. And then I was like, you know what? This kind of sucks. All right. So tell us about uh, your channel. What inspired you to, I'm sure, take a lot of time to provide some advice and guidance for pre-meds and medical students via YouTube? So when I was back in college, um, I got super lucky. I went to a great college called St. Mary's College of California. It's in the East Bay in the small little city up in the hills of Moraga. Um, super small classrooms. Every upper division class is max at 16 students and one PhD. No TAs, no big lecture halls. Super small and intimate. Really kind of a unique experience. And I didn't do too well. And I've said this in many of my videos. I did not do too well in high school. I wasn't that dedicated. I wasn't really challenged. I was just kind of doing my own thing, playing around. And then I thankfully went to a good college, got a lot of intensive mentoring by people who showed an interest in me. And I also had, a, you know, I wanted to perform well. And I got lucky in that professors were willing to invest time in me to kind of make me stronger. And I was looking back and I would call my friends on the phone back in high school and try to share what I, you know, the advice I was getting. And it became, you know, quite cumbersome pretty early on. One friend would talk to another and he'd be like, hey, can you talk to this guy too and kind of share stuff? And then eventually I realized I needed like at least some type of platform. I could just make a video or put my audio out there and then my friends could just see it. It would just save me time and then I could follow up with them and we could hang out or whatever. Um, and back then YouTube was still in its early ages. Um, I had a little Sony camera webcam that I thought was super cool back then. Um, and I would just put, I would literally put it on a shoe box and just record myself thinking it was my friends that I was talking to, um, just trying to share experience and uh, let them know how it was going. 
And then for whatever reason, YouTube, um, people started finding me. There wasn't that many of us doing that kind of work at YouTube at the time. Uh, people in college, people who were pre-med, um, even high school students were reaching out saying, hey, thanks for the videos. You know, here's some questions. What do you think? Um, and that's kind of how it started off in the early days. It was just me trying to help my friends and people kind of found me on the Internet. Um, and then since then, I kept doing it through college. I did it through med school, did it through MBA year, did it through intern year so far. Um, it just kind of grew and the channel went with me. It went through high, you know, the college years. It went through pre-med, went all through med school, included business, went through the match with me um, and now is including uh, residency work as well. Okay, cool. And I did notice, um, so you have a minor in theology and religious studies. <laughs> That's right. So my college was a Catholic liberal arts school. So was mine. We had about 2,500 undergrads. And I actually studied uh, theology and philosophy as an undergraduate student. So I, I guess we're in good company together. No, I mean, I think I remember being there and I was studying biology like most pre-meds do. And at that school, you had to take one or two courses just to kind of graduate in theology and philosophy. And I started to realize this really aided my understanding of medicine, not so much the science side, but more the art and human perspective. Um, and I, and I got to say, who I am today and probably the worldview I have was largely impacted by the studying I did in college. And not so much the basic science, to be honest, but much more that kind of philosophy and learning how to think at an earlier age. Yeah, definitely. All right. So how do you plan your videos? Do you just, you're sitting in rounds one day and you're like, I need to make a video on um, the four essential study habits for <laughs> medical students. Uh, and that is kind of how my brain works. I wish I had a more organized way of life. But, you know, my viewers honestly are such a big inspiration. I will get comments and questions and emails about, hey, could you make a video about this? And I'll, and I'll read it. I'm like, it's a genius idea. Thanks. And I'll reply with, you know, hopefully I'll make that the next month or so. Um, but sometimes, I mean, I, I literally now have a piece of paper next to my bed on the nightstand because I do wake up sometimes in the middle of the night with an idea as embarrassing and nerdy as that sounds or I'm in the car so now I have like a notepad in the car by my bed I just don't have one in the shower but like I just kind of get ideas randomly I don't know where they come from I wish I knew the triggers you know if, if this was doctoral and I was trying to work up epilepsy I, I, I don't know the trigger who knows <laughs> what's well two questions first which video is your favorite I, probably the study of ha the power of habits. Okay. Because that kind of hits me, I think, where I like to talk about the most, which is strategy. And just like simple, you know, people use the word life hacks. That's like a popular phrase. But just simple strategy to get through life and perform better. Um, the habits video, I talk because it's very personal to me. I talk about how I just kind of give myself a harder work ethic, how I trick myself into working more. Um, you know, you can tell people what to study and how, but if they don't have the good infrastructure, they're going to probably have a bit of difficulty. So that one was fun because I got to, you know, I read a couple of good books. I used it in practice and I just got so excited. It kind of reminded me back of the super early days when I was just dying to share info with people. So you're talking the how to study when you don't want to, the power. Exactly. Of okay. Um, I'm reading uh, uh, Cal Newport's Deep Work now. So, yeah, uh, I read that book, actually. I know. It's it's phenomenal. I actually read A.G. Sertelange, the Dominican priest who wrote The Intellectual Life, um, probably like 10 years ago. And he quotes extensively from that book. And I just my, my heart started beating so fast when he quoted him because I, I love that book. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah this <laughs> is great. This is like a modern, uh, uh, modern version of that. All right. So your your favorite one. How to study when you don't want to, the power of habits. If you can provide advice on that, I am sure that is valuable, especially going into dedicated step one prep time. So aside from that, though, what has been the most successful or highest number of views uh, video? <laughs> so by far, the, the guide to the complete physical exam is our most popular video. Last I checked, and that was a few months ago, I think it was at 860,000 views or something. Yeah, right. Uh, it was this morning, and you know it. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I wish I had that much time now. But that one is by far our most famous. I actually made that video as a first-year medical student with one of my classmates. 
Um, and actually, he's going to be at USC with me next year. We're both going to be in the same hospital for residency, ironically. Cool. You know, I went to med school at UC Irvine, and we have this course called Clinical Foundations. Some schools call it like the basics of doctoring, where they teach you how to do a physical, get history, interact with patients, etc. And I, I mean, for me, the physical exam was probably one of the most exciting parts of getting into medicine. I love it. I feel like it gives a deep connection between physician and patient. Um, and so when I started med school, I was deeply excited to learn the physical exam. And I met my friend, Bubba is his name. And he also liked the physical exam. And I was like, man, why don't we make like a comprehensive video showing the stuff we've been learning as med students on how to make a physical exam. And maybe in a few years, we'll like look back and say, oh, that's how we used to do it by the textbook, perhaps. And maybe other students can see it as well. Because um, we were really into it. And we you know, we set up a webcam that we connected to a laptop and put that on a tripod. We found a study area, got some sheets and some bed, and we we begged the hospital for a gown to look kind of professional in the video. And I had my short white coat on looking really geeky. And we just did the whole physical exam. And for some reason, that thing just did really well. People wanted to see it. All right, cool. I'll have to, I did not look at that one, but I will because I'm looking at the screenshot now. So uh, let's get into a little bit about neurology, which my guess is the physical exam, probably your love for that influenced your decision on that specialty. And we've got some questions that hopefully can illustrate not only your, your deep passion for the physical exam, which I'm sure will continue to exist in your specialty, but less and less so in a lot of others. First one is a 19-year-old woman who comes to the emergency department because of fever, confusion, and headache. Her medical history is significant for herpes simplex virus. Lumbar puncture reveals increased protein and increased lymphocytes, and the glucose is 66 milligrams per deciliter. An MRI shows increased signal in the left temporal lobe, and the interrogatory is, which of the following visual defects is most likely present in this patient? A, bitemporal hemianopsia, everybody's favorite hemianopsia. By <laughs> B, left eye anopsia. C, left inferior homonymous quadrantinopia. D, right eye hemianopsia. Or E, right superior homonymous quadrant. Tenopia. And you wonder why no one wants to do neuro. <laughs> <laughs> or ophthalmology. Correct. I've all, already in the past month complained about having to learn things about the eye, so I, I will refrain. All right, you're studying for step one, and you just see all these like unpronounceable <laughs> answer choices. How do you approach this question? Okay. It's, this question is not hard, but it really does teach one key principle. And that's, you don't have to know everything. Just at first, know the big picture ideas. Um, and over time, you'll know more. The stupid analogy from Shrek of an onion, you don't have to know the whole onion. Just try to get the out, just get the core of it. And then over time, you can add on layers and layers of more detail. So starting with the question, I, I mean, I just took step three two weeks ago, and I still do this philosophy. I read the last sentence first. I like that strategy because it tells me what's, what, are the, what are people asking me? Uh, whether it's what's the best test, what kind of symptoms. So I kind of got a sense of I know what I'm doing during the question. Maybe not everyone does that, but I just like it. So starting with the question, she's coming into the emergency department. So I know it's a hyperacute or acute problem. So not subacute, not subacute on chronic, not chronic. Or it could be, but something's flaring enough that she came to the ED. Fever, confusion, and a headache. I mean, you probably are going to be thinking meningitis to some degree. Yep. Um, he headache. Uh, confusion. Okay, that could be like encephalopathy, maybe, or ICP increase. But the fever kind of makes you think meningitis. Someone who's young, nineteen, probably isn't going to be having a brain bleed or some kind of like cancer at this young of an age. So keep it simple. Probably meningitis. She's got a history of herpes simplex virus. They're probably. I mean, that could be a red herring, but they're probably telling you for a reason. And it's oral herpes, so that's close to the face and cranial nerves. Um, and then they're just giving you great data. They did an LP showed increased protein. Uh, overall, whenever you look at an LP, increased protein is a sign of inflammation. So if your protein's high, there's some type of irritation or inflammation going on in there. Lymphocytes, white counts high, and glucose is 66. So normal glucose CSF, 40 to 70. So glucose is normal. So if I was thinking bacterial meningitis, if I was thinking meningitis, 
you know, you're going to think viral versus bacterial. Normal glucose, it should go, it should go down. So probably something viral. Then they even give you more great data. They did, they got an MRI and it showed increased signal in the left temporal lobe. And the question which we knew, which of the following is, I guess we'll say most likely to be in this patient. Um, so they're giving us some key data. You're already thinking meningitis. You're thinking more viral compared to bacterial because the glucose is normal. And the fact that the temporal lobe lit up and she has a history of HSV, uh, you're thinking HSV encephalitis. Um, and the reason is we'll go through like the CSF findings a little more detailed in a minute. Um, but by temporal or temporal lobe enhancement in a meningitis patient is HSV until proven otherwise. Yeah. Uh, start the patient on acyclovir. No questions. You, you can be wrong later. Um, so that's, I think the first key is knowing how to analyze your CSF. So if you can't get the CSF right, you probably won't get the other questions right. So real basics, if you've got a normal CSF, you shouldn't really have many white cells, like zero to five. Like I said, normal glucose, 40 to 70, and you shouldn't have a lot of protein. Bacterial meningitis, we all know it well. Tons of white blood cells. And that makes sense. It's a bacterial infection. White cells are going to be there. It's like a pus like anywhere else. You're going to have low glucose, bacteria eating up sugar, because that's what they do. And again, high protein, because protein's an inflammatory marker. There's something growing in there. It's irritating stuff, inflammation, you're going to have it. But then compare that to viral meningitis, you'll have an increase in white cells, but not that much, normal glucose, and you'll have an elevated protein, but not through the roof. Um, so in this case, we thought about it, temporal lobe enhancement, totally uh, almost a buzzword for viral encephalitis. Um, and also normal glucose making you feel much more comfortable and she's got a history. So now you're thinking, oh man, I got this. The answer has got to be HSV encephalitis. I'm a neurologist. And then the answer choices are, are another level. You're like, oh my Lord, what do they do to me? Right, exactly. So this is not that hard. People worry about, oh, is this too neuro opto for me? This is the ease. This is easier than learning like heart failure because there's only like five things to know. Don't learn the whole pathway and every little nuance. Just learn the big deals. So what, all you got to think about is the actual how does vision get made? So you start at the macula and you move backwards. So if someone had a lesion to the optic nerve, they're going to have option B, left eye anopsia. So the whole left optic nerve or the whole optic nerve is hit. The whole eye is out. There's, it, this is all before um, the chiasm. So if you hit that early, the vision's out in that eye. Well, this person doesn't have left eye anopsia. They have or the different finding because it's we're going to be much more back if we're temporal. Yeah. Next one after the optic nerve is going to be the optic chiasm. And classically, people love optic chiasm. If you have a lesion there, you're going to get bitemporal hemianopsia or like horse blinders, as people like to call them. So you, again, you know it's not option A. It's not bitemporal hemianopsia because again, temporal lobe is much more back. Now, if you hit one of the optic tracks, you're going to get um, what is it? a right or left eye hemianopsia. And that means one, like the left side of your vision or the right side of your vision is just gone, but that's post-track. Then comes the actual valuable parts that people often will get quizzed on on the wards and is honestly a much harder question, so it's probably why it's being asked here, is after the optic track is Myers loops, mm -hmm. and that's in the temporal lobe. And after the Myers loops, what you're going to care about is what's called the dorsic optic radiation, and that's in the parietal lobe. So knowing the word Myers loops and dorsic optic radiation, that doesn't really matter. Just know in the pathway, you're in the temporal lobe and then you're in the parietal lobe. So if you have a lesion in Myers loops, the top left or some type of top superior right or left is going to be hit. And if you go back to the parietal, it's the lower part. That's all you got to memorize. Myers is going to be superior and in the parietal lobe, it'll be inferior. So this patient comes in, they have herpes simplex, we know it's a temporal lobe lesion. All you got to know from neuroopto is temporal lobe lesion, okay, temporal lobe, that's Myers loops, that's a superior hit above. And they don't even ask you a left-right differentiation, which would be too fancy for the wards. Um, so that's all you got to know. Not hard. All you got to know is temporal lobe, Myers loops, the superior part will be hit, go down to the parietal lobe, the lower part will be hit. It, it kind of makes sense. Um, and anything before that, you can pretty easily figure out. Um, optic chiasm, everyone loves by temporal hemianopsia. You hit the track, obviously you've already crossed and you're down to one sided vision and otherwise optic nerve, the whole thing's gone on one side. Got it. So this 
So really the takeaway point here is your temporal lobe's messed up. If you're going to have a visual defect um, because of that, it's going to be a superior homonymous quadrantinopia, which was choicey. And people use the phrase pie in the sky for that. Oh, that's right. I totally forgot about that. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, that's excellent. That was all pretty high yield. Do you have any other like... Uh... That's all. I mean, we could talk about herpes simplex. Ad nauseum, yeah. <laughs> Ad nauseum. We talked about, I mean, I think the key is knowing CSF findings, the glucose, how high is the white count, do you have an inflammatory reaction or not, that'll help you. The MRI findings of bitemporal enhancement or even unilateral enhancement. And then if you hit temporal, it's going to be superior. Or if you hit the parietal lobe, it's going to be an inferior vision loss. Okay. And oh, I guess the one other point is this is specifically HSV1, correct, that is associated with uh, viral encephalitis. That's right. And, th and that makes sense. HSV1 being more oral and HSV2 being more genital. HSV1 going into the ganglion and then kind of reactivates and can, can hit the CNS. Okay. Got it. But just so you know, HSV2 can clearly be there. It, it, you can get HSV2 in the mouth as well. Yeah. And I, I suppose a pediatric population in terms of uh, neonates um, have the potential to get an HSV2 CNS infection after shortly after birth if their mom is uh, afflicted with that virus. Exactly. All right. Let's move on. Next. Okay. We have a 57-year-old man coming to the office because of leg pain and urinary incontinence for the past two years. Mm -hmm. He says he can't remember ever seeing a doctor before, and his medical history is therefore uncertain. The pain shoots down the legs and has a sharp burning characteristic to it. When asked to walk, he lifts his knees high and slaps his feet down, placing them widely and irregularly. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? And our answer choices here are A, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, B, brown saquard syndrome, C, discitis, D, tabes dorsalis, or E, transverse myelitis. Now, this is the kind of question that I used to hate studying for for step one. Um, I always felt like it was way too outside of my range simply because there were so many findings in the actual question stem. So they're asking you what's the most likely diagnosis or what is the diagnosis. Um, so the guy's a bit older. He's 57. He comes in with leg pain. Okay, urinary incontinence. Anyone with urinary incontinence, red flag. If it's, you know, it, you're worried. Is it something going on with the spinal cord now? But it's urinary incontinence for two years. So it's not a hyper acute problem. Yeah. Um, it's actually a chronic problem. He never goes to a doctor. Okay, so maybe, I mean, not a dead giveaway, but maybe something brews in him that he never got treated. Um, but it would be pretty weird to have a serious spinal cord problem that you never go get treatment for. Um, and But this is the key. Uh, leg pain shoots down his legs. Uh, we can also call that lancinating pains. Mm -hmm. Sharp burning characteristics to them. And when he walks, he has to do this high steppage, uh, an irregular gait. And why you have to do that is usually dorsal column affection, where you can't tell where your body is in space, so you overcompensate into this kind of silly gait. Um, so the choices really kind of help you out a lot. Uh, the first choice is amyotropic lateral sclerosis. Um, and this pure motor neuron disease, both upper and lower motor neuron key finding that a good, I mean, I've seen it ALS in real life and you often will see it. And frequently people will, will put this on a board question because it's very specific and that's going to be tongue fasciculations. Hmm. Um, if you see it or not, that's a great one to see if that's, that super helps you, but if it doesn't, it's okay. Pure motor neuron disease and the bowel and bladder are absolutely spared. So someone who's having urinary incontinence can't be ALS. Got it. And just as a high yield point for ALS, only one treatment, real use old. Just in case you ever get right. asked, only, we only have one treatment. So yeah, start with an R, R-I-Z, just memorize that, I guess. But honestly, I did. I was like, really, so that's all I need to know. It's a pure motor neuron disease. <laughs> and that's the key. People with ALS, I mean, there was the ice bucket challenge, have pure motor and upper motor neuron lesions, but that's all they have. It's kind of the interesting thing. Their mentally and autonomics are all intact. So pure motor neuron disease, 
is all you have to really know. And if it's upper motor neuron or a lower motor neuron, you can see cool things like tongue fasciculations that you don't really see in other conditions. Uh, brown cigar syndrome, you automatically know from that that it's that's a uh, spinal cord problem, hemisection of the spinal cord, usually trauma, could be a tumor, could be infection, or super cool could be infection. And this, you know, everyone, this is like a more classic one, the ipsy and the contralateral symptoms. You can, if you look in a full neuro textbook, this gets annoyingly long, but keeping it like core for step one, at the level of the lesion where we hemisected on that same side, we lose sensory at that lesion and we lose um, dorsal column below that region. And on the opposite side, it's that same level, you lose spinal thalamic tract. That sounds confusing probably from how I said it because it's neurology. They use fancy words to confuse you. But they wear bow ties, so it's okay. Wait, is, is that intentional? Because I always felt like it was. It is, but let me tell you in a nice <laughs> way. As one of the, I'm going to try to make it simple. So <laughs> ipsilateral, where the lesion is, is where they can't feel. You start touching, they can't feel it. And that same side, the dorsal column's affected. So they don't have proprioception. They don't know where their arms are in space. They can't feel vibration. They can't tell tactile. And that's on the same side. And the only thing you need to know for the opposite side is pain and temperature. So you do have to memorize. Same side, you have a, a, a line of sensory where the lesion is, and on that side, the dorsal columns hit, and on the opposite side, pain and temperature with the spinal thalamal tract. We don't hear any about this in the case. Um, maybe some dorsal column stuff, but we don't hear anything about a focused lesion. There's no ipsy contra component. The guy seems pretty symmetrical. So again, pretty unlike, and brown cigar is a very specific presentation. So if you're seeing an ipsy dorsal lateral and a contralateral spinal thalamic, it's going to be brown cigar. They're not going to trick you. So that's a pretty easy one you can rule out quickly. Uh, next one is discitis, which just means an infection of the intervertebral disc. Th I mean, this is going to look like a severe, severe back pain patient. You touch their back, they're screaming. We don't get this symptom again. We're getting like, Guy's been uncomfortable for two years with leg pain, not the guy's dying in pain in front of you. Um, second, patients are going to have a lack of mobility, not this like weird high steppage gait, and they're going to be sick. They could have an epidural abscess. They could be showing up in the ICU or the wards with sepsis or septic shock. So it doesn't look like a localized thing. It looks much more spread out to this guy. Urinary incontinence, legs are acting weird bilaterally, not so localized, like a true in little infected thing like this, this guy is. Just because it's around the spinal cord doesn't mean you're going to have a full neuro symptom. Anything can be infected. Um, next one is Tabes dorsalis, which is the right answer in this case. And that's because the guy's got tertiary syphilis. Who would have thought? It just comes out of nowhere. Seems like a nice guy. He's 57, doesn't go to the doctor, so he's not, like, bothering you. You know, he's he's got, like, all these symptoms. Then, boom, Tabes dorsalis. And that's the interesting thing. When I first read the case, my mind didn't go to Tabes dorsalis. I was like, what are the options here? What are, what are they trying to get at? Because it's not like a – no one thinks about tertiary syphilis or Tabes dorsalis that quickly. I mean, it's not something that's on our radar. I mean, how frequently do you even see syphilis anymore or the later manifestations? Unless you're kind of a more rural or a more of a county program, it's just not very common. Or you're listening to this podcast, in which case you'll probably see it three times within the next month just because we brought it up. <laughs> you're <Right>? welcome. But <laughs> Tabes dorsalis is a big deal. Tertiary syphilis is tested because who the hell thinks about it? Yeah. And I like tertiary syphilis. So what is it? Tabes dorsalis. So who gets syphilis? I mean, we know. Uh, MSM, HIV-infected patients, um, and hiv Infected patients are much more likely to progress up and get neurosyphilis versus others. Uh, we all know it's trepidema pallidum, spirochetes. All right, so you got someone, they had primary or primary syphilis. They didn't go to the doctor, I guess. The guy didn't get penicillin because he doesn't go to the doctor much. He probably got some stages of secondary syphilis. Again, who knows what he was doing. Uh, and now tertiary syphilis comes along and he has Tabes dorsalis. So Tabes dorsalis is, literally translates into the decay of the back dorsalis being the dorsal column. So if dorsal column's affected, we're going to have some key findings. One, for this guy, he has lancinating pains. Like he says, the pain shoots down my leg. He's got urinary incontinence. Now, the next option is transverse myelitis, which also has neuro, uh, urinary incontinence. But this guy's had it for two years. So it's not a hyperacute thing like you see in transverse myelitis. It's slow. So tabes dorsalis, you do get neurogenic urinary incontinence, but it's not overnight. 
And when you get it, this, these people, for some reason, have been away. So lancinating pain. He does have urinary incontinence. And he also has this sensory ataxia. This guy has a very weird gait. He lifts his knees high and slaps them down the floor because he can't tell where his feet are in space. He, ha he lacks proprioception. So it's kind of a, it really, if you think about it in the sense that it's urinary incontinence, which only a few things have, he's been going on for two years, he's got leg pain, which is very kind of a thing you see with tabius dorsalis, and he has poor proprioception, so dorsal columns affected, it all kind of points to tabius dorsalis at this point. Yeah, so if I were writing this question, I probably would have made it about like, Nietzsche. Do you know the story of Nietzsche? Uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, the philosopher, he apparently went and listened to uh, Wagner's uh, Ring Cycle, Der Ring des Nibelungen. You know, it's got the flight of the Valkyries in there. Um, mm. And he was so inspired by this, this, this magnum opus um, as sort of like a a statement of the Uberman that he went to a, a Leipzig brothel, deliberately infected himself, the story goes, with syphilis. <laughs> as sort of like an affront to God. And then uh, later, probably had a very similar clinical picture to the person in this vignette, um, but also went mad and died of uh, neurosyphilis. But I, I'm sure like right before dying, he was, you know, doing this high stepping gait, um, had these lancinating pains. Poor, poor guy. Poor guy. Yeah, poor guy. And of course, two more things. One, our God Robertson pupil, ah, it accommodates right. but doesn't react, kind of like with our steroid prostitution. And a side point here, just because we're talking about tertiary syphilis and the actual management's interesting. So most things with syphilis we treat with penicillin, right? Mm -hmm. If you got primary, we give you IM penicillin. Um, if you have even secondary syphilis, we still give you IM penicillin. There's only one case in which you give someone IV penicillin, and that's neurosyphilis. Yep. So simple to know. Everyone's getting IM. It can be for the duration varies on how long you've had it. But if you've got neurosyphilis, you're getting IV penicillin. Now, what if you're allergic to penicillin? Too bad. It's penicillin. You're going to get desensitized. <laughs> so that's how good penicillin is for these problems. You have neurosyphilis and you start complaining to me about your pen, uh, pen, pen allergy, we're going to desensitize you and then I'm going to give you penicillin to fix it. So side point here, always treat you with penicillin. Just know the IM, IV route difference. And too bad if you're allergic, you're getting it anyways. Thank you. That that was a very succinct summary of some high yield <laughs> syphilis points and very forceful too. I, I'm sure your uh, your bedside manner is is not at all, <laughs> yeah. not at all a, the delivery so. in that that manner. <laughs> but that's how I think about it in my head to remember it. He's getting it whether he likes it or not. I like it. I like it. All <laughs> Just, right. And last option here is transverse myelitis. And I, when I first read the question, whenever I hear urinary incontinence, I just think of transverse myelitis. But for two years, come on. So transverse myelitis, neuroinflammatory condition of the spinal cord, usually post-infectious, can be bacterial, can be virus. It can even be post-vaccine. Oh, that's kind of awkward. Or if you have any autoimmune disease. But the key with transverse myelitis, and people love to pimp on this on the wards, bimodal distribution. You're young, 10 to 19. You're a bit older, 30 to 39. That's when these people get it for some reason. Hmm. And these people do have both sensory and autonomic dysfunction. So in this case, it'll be bowel, it'll be bladder, it'll be sexual. But this is going to be acute onset. Usually the case is going to be someone had a GI thing, they had an upper uri thing. A um, couple of days later, they start to feel this. So it's not going to be, guy was fine for two years and then now comes in with urinary incontinence. Got it. So transverse myelitis, see some kind of infection prior, acute onset, um, demyelination, bimodal age distribution versus tertiary syphilis in a guy who's going to have like, you know, you don't, you don't hear about these uh, lancinating pains in transverse myelitis. You don't hear about dorsal column, weird steppage gait. It's just sensory and autonomics. Next, a 35-year-old woman comes to the office because of numbness and tingling in her lower limbs for the past two days. She reports a recent influenza infection, which subsided three days ago. Over the past day, the numbness has become accompanied by weakness and spread to the upper extremities. Her temperature is normal, pulse is normal, respirations are normal, and her blood pressure is normal. Which of the following test results will confirm the diagnosis. 
a albuminocytologic dissociation in the cerebral spinal fluid, B, decreased cerebral spinal fluid glucose, C, a positive edrophonium challenge, D, a positive fluorescent treponemal antibody absorption test, or E, a positive culture for Campylobacter jejuni. This is a good one. The key, okay, this is the key that, you know, I learned the hard way by doing questions over time. Last sentence says, which of the following tests will confirm the presumptive diagnosis? So which of the following is the best test for the diagnosis? Don't pick the good one. Don't pick the okay one. Don't pick one that may be the diagnosis. Which one will confirm it? All right, so that's why I like reading these first. You, you know, you could get to the answer choice and be like, oh, two or three could be okay. Go back to the question, which of the following will confirm the diagnosis, a.k.a. gold standard, whatever you want to call it. It'll be the home run. So a 35-year-old woman comes in, numbness and tingling in her lower extremities. That's confusing. Uh, past two days, okay, it's an acute problem. Recent influenza infection that went away three days ago. Oh, God. Neuro loves a recent upper or lower GI infection. It causes a problem. Then she progresses, which is important, progressive of symptoms. She initially just had numbness and tingling. Now she has this weakness that has spread from down low up high to the upper extremities no fever pulse is normal respiration is normal so vitals are stable nothing to worry about so you got a lady recent infection start to had weakness or started with numbness and tingling then developed weakness so you're thinking probably some neuromuscular thing might be going on at this point point. and in, in fact and i think this is a pretty classic presentation for well, I guess what I'm saying is I like your strategy, and I recommend this too, of reading the interrogatory first. It saves disappointment because you'll read through this straight through, and you'll be like, yeah, 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 this is Guillain-Barre. This is Guillain-Barre. And then you read which of the following tests will confirm the presumptive diagnosis. You're like, oh, man. <laughs> exactly. And I'll tell you, not everyone agrees with my idea with reading the last sentence first. No, I know. You got to find what works for you. Yeah. So first answer is albuminocytologic disassociation in the CSF. I mean, the case is pretty clear. It's an ascending weakness, status post to recent infection, got to be GBS probably. Um, but the question becomes, what is the differential diagnosis for ascending weakness or paralysis, you could even say, versus descending paralysis? Um, so if you have that differential in your mind, you don't have to, but it, it always helps. So if you have descending, think Botox infection. If you have ascending, think polio, think GBS, and what's called tick-borne paralysis. And that's kind of it for the most part. I mean, I'm sure there's more that we're going to quote, but for step one, you, you're not going to do your neuro boards. If it's coming down, think Botox. If it's going up, think tick, polio, and GBS. And you mean specifically like botulinum toxin. Oh, thank you. Yeah, botulinum toxin. Uh, so kid gets botulinum toxin, gets a descending paralysis versus the ascending. After being given honey before age one. Well, what were the parents thinking? Exactly. <laughs> um, so, right, sorry about that, yeah. Um, so, this guy, ascending paralysis, I already know my differentials, polio, GBS, um, and tick-borne paralysis. No comment of tick. Polio seems random here, so it's got to be GBS. So, GBS is going to be diagnosed different ways. So, number one thing they have here is albuminocytologic disassociation. That is as pathognomonic for GBS as is coronary artery disease with McDonald's. You should know this one. <laughs> well, what if you're like a, I don't know, like an OBGYN or something, and you're like, what is albuminocytologic disassociation? All right. So we talked about CSF analysis when we talked about the viral meningitis case or vital encephalitis. Yeah. So we said normal, can have normal white blood cells, normal glucose, low protein. If you have GBS, you're going to have normal white cells. And that's the fun thing. There's only two times in which you're going to have normal white cells. You are normal or you got GBS. Okay. But there's only one time in which your protein is through the roof, and that's GBS. So normal white count with a really, really high protein count, that's an albuminocytologic disassociation. Yeah, the protein's high, the white count's not. What's going on? Normally, like bacterial meningitis, viral meningitis, they're both high. You know, it makes sense. White count's up, inflammation's up. But in the case of GBS, there is no white count. There is no infection. But the protein's really high. And like we said earlier, 
High protein to CSF is an inflammatory reaction, and GBS is just that. It's an autoimmune disease that's it's inflammatory now. So albuminocytologic disassociation is so pathognomonic, we can use it to confirm the diagnosis. Um, so that's kind of a dead giveaway. You just got to kind of memorize that one. But it's not that bad because, like I said, there's only two, two cases of a normal white count, and that's normal in GBS, and protein's only super high in GBS. Got it. All right. Other choices here, super important to go through. Decrease CSF glucose. Well, if it's a decrease in glucose, you're only going to see that under one condition. That's bacterial meningitis. Also, tuberculosis meningitis. But again, these things are not like viruses. They're eating the bacteria or eating the sugar. So bacterial meningitis, glucose, we said normal was 40 to 70. So less than 40. It's going to be bacterial. This guy doesn't sound bacterial meningitis at all. No fever, no photophobia, no stiff neck, no confusion, no headache. This sounds too distal. Next option is a positive edrophonium challenge. If I could tell you how much I hate this word edrophonium, it wouldn't even begin. I don't know where to start. <laughs> also called the tensilon test. People just like throwing these words in there. One, there's two words and two, it confuses you. So edrophonium, or also called tensilon, is an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. We use it to diagnose myasthenia gravis. The myasthenia gravis, neuromuscular disease, antibodies against the acetylcholinesterase receptor, and just to add on another layer, because this is the kind of stuff I always see on boards now in real life, what kind of hypersensitivity reaction is that? Type 2, antibody to something, type 2, complex 3. So myasthenia gravis, antibody against the receptor, type 2 hypersensitivity, antibody usually comes in the thymus, and this also has a bimodal distribution. Women, 20 to 30, men, 70 to 80, old. And this gives you progressive weakness with use. Something for us to look forward to. Oh, it's going to hit us. We better take our thymus out while we can. <laughs> so progressive weakness with use, all, the opposite of Lambert Eaton, essentially. So for these people, you know, they, the first thing they always complain about is, you know what, my ex, they don't come in and tell you my extra mus, extra ocular muscles are fatigued, but they tell you, man, my eyes are a little tired or I'm, or I'm look, getting some blurry vision. Uh, that's because the extraocular muscles are getting fatigued from the myasthenia. So we give them an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor blocker, tensilon, or also called edrophonium, and then they feel better. The, the weakness goes away. Wow, we diagnosed something. But this doesn't sound like that. It doesn't have like an ascending picture. It's just mainly uh, small muscles that are hyperused, like the eye first. Got it. And then option D, fluorescent treponemal antibody absorption test, also called the FTABS. That's for syphilis. It's not neurosyphilis. Is this neurosyphilis? Doesn't sound like no. it to me. It sound like Davies or Salas. If I was going to treat this guy with neurosyphilis, how would I give him the penicillin? You would give it IV. Got to give it IV. What if he's allergic? He's still getting penicillin. Don't care. You're getting it. Tough life. <laughs> so this doesn't sound like syphilis. We just talked about it. No weird gait, no pain. This guy's got an ascending thing. Ascending is in syphilis. This kind of movement is in syphilis. E, I thought, was the only fair complementary answer. Positive culture. I like to call the most attractive distractor. I love your formal terminology. <laughs> I made it up. If I could I think. be as educated as you. Actually, I got to <laughs> learn. So positive culture for Campylobacter jejuni. I mean, you can quickly knock out the middle answers and get to this one. So here's the thing. Most people with GBS will have some type of upper respiratory or lower GI infection. Campylobacter is like as overused of a buzzword as you could get for GBS. <laughs> and someone may see this and say, this sounds like GBS. Oh my God, Campylobacter, I nailed that one. Thank you, first aid. That person didn't do too well because they forgot to read the last line and say, what are they asking me? Like my teacher said in college, my favorite uh, general chemistry teacher, answer the question being asked, not the one you want to answer. You want to answer Campylobacter because it's easy and fun, but unfortunately, it's not the answer. So if it's which one of the following is going to confirm it, Campylobacter could be the cause, or you could just have Campylobacter and have GBS for another reason. It ain't going to sell it to you. Um, so of all the options, what will confirm it is this albuminocytologic disassociation. We only see it with GBS. Normal white count, super high protein, too weird to be offset, dead giveaway for GBS. Wow, that was great. You packed so much neuroscience into the past like 45 minutes or however long we talked. 
you almost made me want to switch specialties almost, <laughs> but, but I can't cause I'm, I'm stuck. I'm, I'm already board certified and I can't be a resident again. I just couldn't handle it. Yeah. It's not that fun. Yeah, it's not. Um, but it's not all bad. Doc Osare, thank you so much for your time. Um, we will be following your YouTube channel closely, linking to you, tagging you in our social media. And anytime you want to come back and teach something, you have a place. Thanks for having me. Always a blast. And as always, enjoy your studies. And for those of you who stuck around to the end, thank you. I want to tell you about a kind of a fun thing we're doing. So this is going to be a fake USMLE question campaign, and we're tying it to a contest. So from now until July 15th, head over to Twitter, go to my page, at Boards Insider, look for the pinned tweet. What we're doing are fake USMLE questions. So here's an example. If Deadpool were in a USMLE question vignette, his most likely diagnosis would be A dissociative identity disorder, B, bipolar disease, C, antisocial personality disorder, or D, other. So here are the contest rules. You want to tag the character on Twitter, for instance, Deadpool is at Deadpool movie in the question vignette, and just set it up like if the character were in a USMLE question vignette, his most likely diagnosis would be, and then make a Twitter poll, pick four answer choices, and tag inside the boards as well as Gomer Blog. That's at Boards Insider and at Gomer Blog. And then finally, use the hashtag FakeUSMLE. The most creative fake USMLE question will get a one-year subscription to our All Audio Cue Bank for free. We'll have fun while doing it. Maybe learn something. I don't know. It was just something that I thought would be a lot of fun. And you can also do it on other social media. I guess Reddit, Facebook, and Instagram, where on each platform we are at Inside the Boards. Or you can just send us an email to info at insidetheboards.com if you would like to contribute to the fake USMLE campaign. Just wanted to thank Rao Reynolds and Enter Shikari for letting us use the track Live Outside off The Spark, their new album, about which Rao said, what I was trying to do with this album in marrying the personal and the political is to ensure that human vulnerability is laid bare and to not be afraid to speak about emotions. Plus, this album is a little lighter than what you heard previously with the song Anesthetist. At any rate, check out entershikari.com. <laughs>